Hello, everybody, and welcome to the IEP Live Learn Lunch. Really thrilled to have you here today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this session brought to us from, by Andy from our NIB. Um, and our fifth in the Seeing Opportunities series, and today we're going to be looking at engaging with employers. So with no further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Andy, who's going to lead on today's session. Um, and as he prepares his slides for us and, and, and we hand over that way, I would just like to remind you all that this is an interactive session. So I would really, really encourage you, if you can, to share your thoughts and questions in the chat box throughout the session. And I will make sure that Andy sees those. So over to you, Andy. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, it's good to be here again. Um, obviously, those of you who have been on the previous four seminars will be used to hearing from Heather. Um, Heather's actually moving house just now. And although she had a, a Wi-Fi connected yesterday, um, it's still not working. That's probably no big surprise. So I'm happy to be here and, and pick up the mantle um, on this the fifth of our um, series. We're talking about our engagement with employers. So we will be talking about, about today about what our NIB does to keep people at job, in jobs, and uh, the work we do with employers uh, when it comes to the employment of people with sight loss. So I'm going to start with some interesting statistics. Um, there are approximately 21,000 people who are registered blind or partially sighted that are currently working across the UK, so 21,000 people in jobs. And they're in quite a wide range of employment sectors. Um, Unfortunately, though, that's only a quarter of, of the people who of working age who could be in work. So you can get a, maybe a, a feel for the size of the issue for us here. Uh, only one in four of our, our working age people uh, are actually in jobs. And on top of that, the research we've done shows us that of those um, one in four who are in jobs, um, quite a significant number of them, again, one in four, uh, left their last job because they either started to have sight issues or their sight deteriorated in some way. Um, and when you look at a group of 50 year olds, for example, about half of the people who develop sight loss uh, leave their job. Um, and that's unfortunate for us because quite a majority of people tell us that if they'd known about the, so the support that was available, they would have been able to stay in their job. So it's quite a big challenge for us and um, that's why our specialist employment team in RNIB uh, works to try and retain people in job. We work with employers and we work with individuals to try and keep them there. In the last year, we're very proud to say that we helped 1,600 people who are blind or partially sighted or whatever phrase they use. Um, 1,600 people we helped stay in their jobs. So that might give you the scale of the, the challenge that's there for us and the amount of people that we, we are helping. Um, we have, within this presentation, we have three short video clips, and in a moment I'm going to move on to the first one, um, because a question that we are often asked is, what jobs can blind people do? Um, so a very short video clip, two and a half minutes, is just coming up. Fingers crossed this works okay. Um, and this was a video put together by people explaining what kind of jobs they do. So I'm going to try and run that now. Any problems, let me know. Only one in four blind or partially sighted people of working age are in employment. We are a valuable, underutilised resource in the UK workforce. See what we can do. I'm Chris Fawcett. Uh, I am currently working as a regulatory compliance manager for a global education company. I'm Laura and I'm an occupational therapy assistant working in mental health. My name is Nathan and I'm a client advice officer. My name is Dan and I'm a graphic designer and 3D visualiser. I'm the director of a corporate events company. I'm the chief operations officer for Lighthouse London. I'm a parliamentary and public affairs manager. I'm a gigging musician from London. I advise the Scottish Government on transport accessibility. I'm director of services at a national charity. I'm the UK's only visually impaired ice hockey player. I have a rare form of macular degeneration, which means for me that I have lots of blind patches in my field of vision. I was born with an eye condition called Leber's congenital amaurosis, and for me, what that means is that I have no useful vision at all. A bleed in my brain caused 
90% vision loss. I'm registered as a severely sight impaired. I have advanced glaucoma and I have tunnel vision. I have albinism, which means my vision is very blurry and I can't see detail. I find myself a lot on stages with a keyboard and a MacBook and a screen reader. All I need is a large monitor and to invert the colour on my screen. I use text-to-speech software to help me do my job. I use screen magnification software. I use speech software on the computer and the inbuilt screen reader in my phone. I use a pair of glasses that have a bioptic telescope. I use an ocular like this for seeing things at distance. I've taught over a thousand children to roller skate. I built my first computer in 2004. I used to work for the civil service in Whitehall as a ministerial private secretary. I'm an administrator for the civil service. I'm a press officer. A community development officer. I'm a locally elected councillor in the London Borough of Brent where I'm also cabinet member for housing and welfare reform. I'm Scott and I'm a camera operator. I have extremely low vision in my left eye and I'm short-sighted in my right. And I made this film. See what we can do. Take our Employment Accessibility Health Check to find out how inclusive your workplace is. Visit rnib.org.uk. RNIB. See differently. Okay. So hopefully that, uh, that technically worked okay. Does anyone have any comments so far or anything to say about the video? So, um, Delida, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right correctly, Delida, um, said that was very insightful and thank you. Excellent, thank you. Well, the message I take from that job is blind people or partially sighted people are successful in quite a wide range of jobs. And the old fashioned notion of the kind of jobs that blind people do is, is very much gone. Um, actually, some people would still would like that, but to be honest, the majority of people feel that's a positive thing. Um, so moving on, um, I mean, if, you, if someone recently experiences a change in their sights or a change in the work environment or a change of job. People often need help and support just to stay in that job. And it's common at that point to feel um, quite anxious and unsure of what to do at this point. Um, and advice at that point we feel is crucial because it helps to keep people in the job. Um, obviously, we want to help as many people as we can in, can in our NIB because we're very committed to the idea that Sight loss shouldn't equal job loss. So that's the message we're trying to get out. Importantly, what can we do to help? So we help employees and we work with them to try and keep in their jobs, um, particularly if, if there's a specific difficulty around sight loss. But also at the same time, we provide a service to employers because often employers just don't know how best to support their employees. And we go about this by um, providing advice and practical um, solutions um, to employers and employees um, so that people are kept at work. Um, this could, Im could include, for example, like advising people about um, use of technology or practical solutions in the workplace. It can be helping an employer to reach a decision about what's, what's a reasonable adjustment. And as we obviously know, the Equality Act makes it a legal duty for employers to, to make reasonable adjustments. So that could be something to do with like assistive technology in a computer or changing duties within a role. Um, so we're very much there to provide that in-between service um, so that an employer can reach an informed decision and a customer can find out what they're looking for or what they need. Um, at the same time, we also work with employers to try and encourage positive and inclusive recruitment. And we're about to launch a new standard called Visibly Better for Employers. It's a bit like the disability confident, except, uh, except it's more specific, and that will be that will be launched soon. And we'll be encouraging employers to have procedures in place to recruit people with sight loss, and also crucially, um, to uh, to be to make those adjustments that are needed to retain people. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to my next slide at the moment. Now we have a bit of a video, and this is where I need Helen's help because um, this will probably go wrong if I try anything. But the question here is, what, what does an employer do if one of their employees is losing their sight or their sight is changing? There are a lot of skills, there's a lot of knowledge and experience they don't want to lose. So over to the video, which is about four minutes long. 
I'm Heather Barbara and I'm the Employment Advisor for RNIB Scotland. Every year many, many people um, are given devastating news that they're losing their sight and for people of working age particularly this is a huge thing because they feel that they're going to lose their jobs. This is not the case, it doesn't have to be that way. People can stay and work and we're here to help. My name's Mel Hanvey. I work for Riverside Housing, which is based in Irvine in Scotland. I love my job, I love the company, and I feel that I give a good service to people. I've been put on eye drops after suffering various conditions over the years, and unfortunately the eye drops had accelerated the condition further. I remember leaving the hospital and being told there was basically nothing that they could do for me. Uh, I, I remember getting the bus home and sitting on the bus thinking, what on earth am I going to do? I love my job, I don't want to leave it. So I went on to the internet to find out the RNIB site and there was a contact address there and I emailed it and, and basically put out a cry for help to see if I could stay in my job and what was out there for me. Well, the amazing thing was by the time I got home, I'd had a reply from the RNIB. Lots of people get in touch uh, with us at RNIB when they're looking for advice about how they can stay and work. Um, and for that reason, we've put together the Let's Work Together pack, and that's to help guide employers uh, around the, the various steps that they can take to keep their employee in work. I came into work and had a meeting with my manager, Dwayne, and just explained that I'd met Heather from the RNIB and told him of the pack that was being introduced. Dwayne himself has said he doesn't know what he would do without that information because he didn't know which way to go. I wouldn't have guessed somebody with a sight impairment could have come back and done this type of job. But now you've got screen magnification, you've got text speak. If a PDF document goes there, she can hear that, she takes part in everything throughout the team. So I would not have guessed we could support somebody like that back into the workplace. Mel came into our RNIB office to look at some software and some demos of different equipment that she might be able to use in work. And that showed her that, yeah, actually I can do my job. There's nothing to stop me. There's equipment here that can help me with that. We spoke about how she could have funding towards the cost of this um, so that it wouldn't cost her employer lots of money. I came to Mel's workplace, uh, met with her manager, Dwayne, and uh, we worked together on a plan to get Mel back into work. I've got bigger monitors. I had Zoom tech software installed. Without it, I couldn't do the job, to be fair. It's, <laughs> pardon the pun, but it's been an eye-opener. It really has. <laughs> Of course, having Marriott um, involved in this project was hugely important. Marriott's a major international employer um, and a name that people are familiar with. And this helped to show that um, this pack is actually workable out there in the real world. I'm Claire Fisher. I work within the HR team for Marriott International and based here at the Glasgow Marriott Hotel. I was delighted to be approached by, by the RNIB to be involved with the employer retention pack um, because Often the adjustments that need to be made are quite minor and they're you know, very important to be able to um, offer employment opportunities to a diverse workforce and um, you know, to do what we can to reduce any barriers that might be there, however small. Staying in work is hugely important to people. It's about our confidence, our independence. We're losing something and we don't need to lose our job as well. Uh, there's lots that can be done to prevent that happening. The day I left the hospital, I actually, I was devastated at the thought of having to leave a job that I really love. Um, and I was just sort of wondering what was going to happen with my future. But after contacting the RNIB, I realised there was hope for me that I could continue working with the right equipment. And time has proven that that's been possible. So it's been fantastic. The Let's Work Together Retention Resource Pack developed by RNIB Scotland in partnership with Marriott Hotel Glasgow is available to download at rnib.org.uk. RNIB. See differently. OK, I'm just going to reload my slides here, if you bear with me for a moment. Um, does anyone have any comments on the... The content there. Uh, no, oh, yes, we do. Catherine said this is incredibly inspiring and such a great facility to support people in need and at difficult times as well as going forward. Well, that's reassuring. 
I have to say that we can't promise to um, to phone everyone back by the time that they finish their, uh, their bus journey, unfortunately. Sometimes it takes us a bit longer. Any other chat in there, Helen? Or, uh, um, yeah, James says he agree. I did think that myself as well, that um, by the time you get home off your bus journey, that's setting the bar high is, is our Heather, isn't she? But uh, no pressure, Andy, no pressure. Yeah. Well, we can always remind Heather the next time that she doesn't manage to phone someone back by the same the bus journey ends that uh, she's got <laughs> to achieve. We could, couldn't we? We have a couple more comments here. Or we have one more comment here, some questions. Okay. Do you engage employers? Do you reach out to a wide range of employers or target specifically those who have blind or sight impaired employees? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, both. Um, RNIB as an organisation depends on a lot of um, sponsorships and corporate relationships. Um, so some of the big companies, for example, I've got Kellogg's in my mind just now because Kellogg's have done some work on their packaging recently to make it easier to identify different types of products. Um, a big company, uh, and they're obviously interested in working with us in a specific area, but because we have that relationship, we're then able to work with them on other areas. Uh, Microsoft, for example, we've done a lot of work with accessibility, um, leading to some of the improvements in Office 365. That's, uh, this packages are much easier to make accessible now. Um, so, yeah, we use the power of how, being a big organisation and having big relationships um, to turn the agenda around when we want to, to talk about um, standards in the field of employment. Um, at the same time, we work very uh, Work is very much based on one-to-ones. If we've worked with 1,600 people last year to keep them in jobs, a lot of that work has been with the employers as well. So we're responding then rather than being strategic about it. So yeah, the, the answer is both, both really. Excellent, thank you. So those are all the questions we have in at the moment. Okay, that's fine. If you think of any more, please add them to the chat and we'll pause at, at the right moment. Um, I just wanted to talk about when we need to do a bit more than just give somebody advice. Um, so we do have a work-based assessment service. And traditionally that means that one of our advisors or one of our specialists goes to visit a workplace. Um, we might talk about equi equipment, software, any, any adjustments that are needed that could be physical adjustments, for example. And it's uh, an assessment of this type is really useful. If someone's just starting to work or, or you've, you've come across a specific obstacle. Um, you sometimes just identifying that someone might need a certain piece of equipment or, a, or some training and using that equipment. You, you may remember looking at the video when Mel was using her PC. She was using slightly non-standard software, but um, doesn't need a lot of training. But sometimes, it, it, yeah, someone needs a bit of help just to get to know the ins and outs of the software they're using. Um, so yeah, that is an option. That's, that's a kind of specialist add-on that we offer to employers. And they're usually, everything we do is, is free, but when we, we do a big job like that, we ask uh, for some money to cover the time because we're taking someone away from working with customers in another area to do that work. But this isn't a sales pitch. I'd just like you to know that work-based assessments are something we offer. Um, also assessments are normally provided uh, by Access to Work, part of the WP. And they're invaluable, particularly for small or medium-sized businesses, um, because the individual requests an assessment, and that's facilitated by the employer. Um, <clears throat> the follow-on from that is, if someone needs to spend a bit of money on software or equipment, then Access to Work can fu either fund it all or fund part of it, depending on the circumstances of the employer and the individual. Um, so yeah, there is there's advice there, specifically some that comes attached to funding uh, and others that is um, that we do more separately when people need it. So that, that is our work-based assessment service, which is part of our overall approach to retaining people. I want to talk about the dreaded risk assessment now, because risk assessments in a workplace where there's someone with sight loss doesn't actually have to be difficult, but it can be very daunting for someone who's never dealt with sight loss before and they have to consider risks. Um, it's very easy just to overestimate a risk or make assumptions of what, of what, about what blind or partially sighted people can do. Um, 
and there can be difficulties there. Um, it's not everyone has to be wrapped up in cotton wool, and we find that often those kind of risk assessments can be quite challenging for the individuals that are concerned. Um, we know that risks can be managed successfully both through our own practice, but also from, from working with employers. We don't go out and do risk assessments for employers because we know it's their responsibility, but we do, we do guide them um, so that people can reach informed decisions and, and avoid any unnecessary barriers. Um, we often get employers direct coming to RNIB saying, I've got to worry about this work situation, how do I deal with it? Often we get questions about lighting or using stairs or trip hazards, using computers and other machinery, mobility, guide dogs in the workplace. And more so at the moment because of COVID, people who are working from, from home when they would normally be working somewhere else. Um, there are always concerns about emergency evacuations. Um, but our job is to advise in that situation, you know, to tell people there's a right way or wrong way to do things. But there is guidance on a website. Um, it's got a snappy title like Guidance for Risk Assessors of Blind and Partially Sighted People, very catchy. Um, but that is there, and we'll talk to employers who have got any concerns about this. Similarly, you know, we talk to employees who, who feel that risk assessments have, have been done without their input or made, made bigger assumptions about what's going on. Um, we do have the added complication, as I mentioned there, of COVID. And we have put some uh, some guidance on a website about when, when people are returning to work and risk assessments are being ca carried out. Um, there are the, the consultations need to be done properly, and um, there are particular areas that employers need to think about. So um, that is on a website if you care to have a look. Um, but I'm now reaching the point where I think we should jump to our third and final video which is we put together is very briefly, about a minute and a half, for employers, top tips for supporting the safe return of employees with sight loss. So Helen, hopefully I can hand over to you now for this. As lockdown begins to ease, RNIB employment advisors are sharing top tips on how to support employees with sight loss as they start to return to the workplace. Ensure any temporary signage is in size 14 font at least. And using tactile floor markers can help indicate one-way systems or boundaries. Adding coloured tape around the edge of protective screens will improve their contrast and visibility. Make sure everyone is informed about any changes you have made to the workplace. To keep everyone safe, ensure that your blind and partially sighted employees know where they can sanitise their hands or equipment that you're using. Don't assume that everyone knows. You may wish to purchase hand sanitizer that comes in coloured or opaque packaging to make it more visible. Employees with sight loss will find it difficult to maintain social distancing, so try and support them where you can. This could include encouraging the rest of your workforce to be more aware of each other. The onus is on sighted staff to keep an appropriate distance from colleagues who are blind or partially sighted. Providing up-to-date information about any new measures is key, but above all else, make sure to speak to your staff. Your employees with sight loss are best placed to describe how they see and what will be best to help them. Just mm -hmm. ask. To find out more about how you can support your employees, call us on 0303 123 9999 or visit our website rnib.org.uk forward slash professionals. Standing with you through every challenge. RNIB. See differently. Okay, I'm going to just pop back to our presentation now. I um, wonder if this is a good time to pause and ask if anyone has any questions at this point. We don't have any questions in the chat at the moment, but we could give everyone a, a moment or two to see if anyone has a specific question they would like to ask. Okay, nothing's come in at the moment. They may be saving their questions for the end. And, uh, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Then. We, we do have comments around the videos being very informative and helpful. And of course, we will be sharing the recording of this session via the YouTube channel. So you will be able to revisit them um, if you wanted to gather some information from them. 
And I believe these are all available via the YouTube channel for RNIB as well, aren't they, Andy? That's right, yes. That's right. Okay, then, um, just, just in, in terms of our resources now, because I realise that, that you as professionals will be working with individuals. You may come across someone who's in a job and is a bit concerned or worried about um, how, how they're going to continue to do their job. Or you, you may be talking to employers um, who want a bit of advice. Uh, most of our advice is available online. So our web website, which is rnib.org.uk, um, has sections there aimed at professionals, which we actually we just heard at the end of the last video, and also a section for businesses um, on services we can offer them. Um, so if you need any further information, then yeah, have a look online. We do have a range of fact sheets as well um, to cover things like recruitment, um, technology, and, and how to get the best out of DWP's Access to Work programme, um, or how you can how you can support your colleague with sight loss uh, to stay in work. And we all we all work busy lives and have different working patterns. So our feeling is it's better to just be upfront and have all that information there and available at any time. Um, the Let's Work Together pack that we mentioned in a previous video is also there. And that, that is designed for an employer to be able to work with their individual and, and kind of work work the best the work the best way of keeping people in jobs. Um, what best assistance we heard of, we can do that for employers when they're looking for quite detailed and specific advice. Um, e-learning, yes, e-learning. Now, many of you, I think, will have seen our e-learning for employment professionals, which has re reached almost 2,000 people now since we launched it. Um, we are working on a separate package for employers. So rather than um, in times gone by, we would have had to book a session for 20 people to turn up and someone from RNIB will come along and talk about sight loss. Uh, we want to give that away to employers so they'll, they'll be able to do that in their own time when it suits them uh, and it will, it will run through the issues and the support that's available for them. I don't have a launch date for that one as yet, but it will be well publicised when it does happen. I imagine it'll be another couple of months away. Um, so that e-learning course will be there for employers. Um, and, and anyone who works within a company um, to, to raise their awareness and make them feel more confident. Um, so that, that's a, a mixture of what we have online now and what we have coming up. And I have reached closing comments. Um, just worth mentioning that all of our services are accessed through our RNIB helpline. The number's on here, 0303 123 or, or by email at uh, helpline at rnib.org.uk. Oh, didn't mean that, sorry. I've reached the end of the slides, perhaps a bit ahead of schedule, so that does leave us time for discussion. If anyone has any questions or anything they'd like to raise, now is the time, so please feel free. Excellent, great. So I have a comment here or a question from Adriana. And Adriana, I'm not sure where you work, so perhaps you can pop that in the chat for us. But she she's asked, could you share any tips and tricks to utilise when invo inviting employers to become guest speakers? The barrier I have identified is they really need a tangible of what's in it for them. Yeah, yeah, you're right. The, the, the e-learning that we're working on just now for employers it's quite frustrating because we, we use some video clips in that and we uh, we wanted to really give employers a voice um, and we found it very hard. Although people would say they were interested in coming forward and being a speaker, if you like to use that phrase loosely, um, it was hard to really get them to commit. So in the in the Let's Work Together video, we, we found we worked with Marriott Hotel Group um, and I think that was just as a result of working, building up a working relationship over time. You know, if, if we support employers um, and they learn to trust us, it becomes a bit easier to then ask them to, to be speakers. Um, and I think it is a good point. You have to be, it has to be something very tangible about, you know, what am I, what am I getting out of this? And apologies if we have any background ground noise here. I hope it's not too bad. No, we can't hear it. It's fine. Okay. It seems someone is demolishing a building nearby. Um, 
And yeah, I think there's always a fear from an employer that if I put my head above the parapet and say what a brilliant employer I am, uh, I'm waiting to be shot down by someone proving me wrong. So yeah, perhaps just being use your really existing relationships and um, be clear on what it is we're asking them to commit to. And we've had a, a further comment from Adriana. Thank you for that. She's at FedCap and she says, you know, they do work on building relationships with key employers where work is available. Um, and there's this aim of making jobs more accessible for people work, um, searching for work. People relate more when they hear directly from the employer. So hence the question. Slightly on a slightly different, the same theme, but a sort of different context. Obviously, I do a lot of work engaging with people like yourself, Andy, to come and deliver um, these sort of webinars and often with people who delivering webinars or public speaking isn't really their thing, but they're subject matter experts in that area. Mm. And I found sort of if you can talk people through this is the support I will give you or I can do as much of the heavy lifting as you need me and be alongside you to help help you with the delivery of the information. Um, employers or, or partner organisations, individuals within them find it easier to commit to doing things because it is quite scary, isn't it, coming on to a, a into a room full of people and 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 standing up there and speaking to them. So I guess my tip or hint from from that point of view would be, you know, to to really outline the the type of support that's there in order to allow them to to come and speak and and take part. Yeah, good point, Helen. Alberto has said, great topic. Are there some partnership organisations or charities that promote specific job opportunities for visually impaired people? Um, yeah, again, that's an interesting question. Um, we, we have some employers that run the discussion with just now who are very keen to, uh, they, they see people with sight loss as being underrepresented in the workforces and they're very keen to offer opportunities. Um, those kind of relationships take a bit of time to build up. And um, yeah, I'm sure at some point there's, there will be advertised vacancies specifically looking for a blind and partially sighted people, but that doesn't happen very often. Um, I, I think the key to any organization like RNIB, to, the key to our success is to work with other agencies. Um, I mean, yeah, people who are represented in this group today will probably have a working relationship with but maybe some of the organisations that aren't, so I don't want to pick any out to promote any. But, but, and websites like Even Break, for example, can be really useful because they advertise in vacancies with disabled people in mind. And uh, that can be a good starting point. Um, but um, yeah, the, the, the actual, the occurrences of a vacancy which, who is for a blind or partially sighted person is very rare. Um, but um, I, I think that for our, from our perspective, we like to see our customers engaging with other services and therefore being able to access the same opportunities as everyone else. But it is a good point. That's great, thank you. So Jake from Daruma Group says, most of the work we do involves getting unemployed, often long-term unemployed individuals back into work, many of whom suffer from disability or poor mental health. How would you engage with a prospective employer to encourage working with such people? Um, for us, it's the fear. Um, I think if our NIB on our own wanted to engage with an employer to help a blind or processed person into a job, I'm not sure it would be that successful. We don't have the capacity for those kind of um, activities that we used to have. Um, I think there are experts in this room. There are experts who are members of IEP. And there are some extremely good um, organisations there that can help people into jobs. I see us as being in the role of adding on to say, yeah, OK, he's an employer who wants to engage with someone and give them a job. We are there to help with the real specifics about, well, how are they going to be able to use that computer? How is this person going to be able to travel as part of their job? And I see us as an add-on to that. So if, you, if you're helping someone find a job and, you've, and you're successful, then please get in touch with us because at that point, we'd like to kind of, you know, take people through the steps they need and engage them with access to work, for example, uh, dealing with mobility and technology there. The other things that we, we have the specialist knowledge 
and um, I think we're kind of value added when it comes to a service of that type. Excellent. So really, and I know several people today, many people have either attended all of these seeing opportunity sessions or watched the recordings. Just having this knowledge that there is this support out there is a way of engaging with employers by being able to have that conversation and saying, you know, that there are things in place. There's technology in place to support. There's, you know, there's organisations that can come in and support people as they join your workforce will make employers feel more confident about opening up those opportunities. Yes, yes. Excellent, good, thank you very much. So those are all the questions we have at the moment. So I'm wondering if anyone else has got a question they would like to ask around employer engagement or anything else to do that you think Andy um, on this topic might be able to help you with um, while we have this time. And um, now is your moment to pop that in the chat. Um, but don't you know it, it's it's always pressure them for people to type as quickly as they can while we're just waiting and see if anyone has got any additional questions I believe we do have another session planned um, I've been speaking with Heather we are going to be having another session um, in August so please do keep your eyes out for that that will come out to you all in the learning network e-bulletins that will be sent out every week on a Wednesday morning as you will all know um, Adriana says, are there any employers who are known for being inclusive from an ageism perspective? That's slightly different, isn't it, to a site? Yeah. Um, I'm going to say the easy, the easy answer to that one is no, but I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to wriggle off the hook with that one because no. um, we don't have a, like a disability confident standard for um, ageism in workplaces. Um, I think though it, it's particularly relevant to us because as people age, there, there are more opportunities for people to have sight loss. Um, and we're very much aware. Um, I know that there have been projects in Scotland um, that have been addressing um, helping uh, people to work, let's say towards the end of their, their working life. That includes me, I think. Um, but specifically supporting people who are, like, for example, over 50 to try and uh, keep them in jobs. And I'm sure that there have been employers involved in that particular project. So if it's happened in Scotland, it must have been replicated in other parts of the UK. Okay. Well, that's something we can look out for. Thank you. And sort of in response to that, Adriana, we, we have been working, the IEP have been working recently or in the, the coming towards the end of a project of developing some e-learning around specifically employability support for older workers, so 50 pluses, um, and we're developing a suite of e-learning modules that will be released in the coming weeks. So watch this space um, and keep an eye out for that. Um, but that, that e-learning is specifically focus, focusing on age rather than the age-related sight loss and that combination. But yeah, the, the, there is something coming from the IEP and Centre for Aging Better um, in the next few weeks and, and by that I mean very soon rather than um, distantly in the future so um, hopefully but she says amazing news thanks for sharing great I, I, I probably should have waited until there was a big announcement but you've asked so you heard it here first and don't tell marketing um, yet <laughs> so um, it's great we are really excited about it okay so we haven't got any more site loss and, and employer engagement related questions coming at the moment okay well, maybe I can thank just you. take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining us today and thank Helen for uh, for dealing with all the nuts and bolts issues in, in the webinar today. So thanks very much. Well, you are very welcome. And I managed to get the videos going without forgetting to put the volume on twice in a row. So that for me is always a win for those of you who do deliver online stuff and have to remember to press those buttons you'll, you'll know where I'm coming from with that so we've got some Jody thank you it's been really useful and informative thank you for attending it's a pleasure to have you all here um so thank you this was our I think it was our 66th live learn lunch I can't believe it they're just flying by it still feels like it was only yesterday I was nervously doing the first one and we've got lots of thank yous coming in. Jay, Delida, Catherine, Daryl, lots. Sorry if I've missed anyone. And um, for those of you who always like me to let them know what's coming next, 
Um, next week, we have the Good Employability Company, um, David, one of our IEP fellows, coming back to look at taking risks and doing good. What does the evidence tell us about who we help and who we harm? So a really interesting one there. Um, so uh, make sure if you haven't already subscribed or registered for that one that you do. Um, the following week, we've got some um, firm favourites of the IEP Live Learn Lunch, Big Dog, Little Dog joining us. And they're going to be looking at employment and depression, why it sucks and what may help and what definitely won't help. Um, so, yeah, two really interesting ones, very diverse and very different ones coming up over the coming weeks. Um, I've really loved today's session. So thank you, Andy, for that. Really interesting. Um, for those of you who want to revisit the session, I will later on, hopefully later on this afternoon, if not tomorrow, be uploading this recording to the IEP YouTube channel. If you're not already subscribed, do pop over there and press subscribe. And what that means is whenever we record any of our sessions and upload it, you will get a notification. And it means if you can't join us on a Wednesday, you don't need to miss that learning. And also for those of you who are IEP members, don't forget you can pop into your membership account on the IEP website and record these sessions as CPD. So please make sure you're doing that. And then when you, rec when you print off your annual CPD certificate, you'll have all those points on there. So um, it's, it's great to have you here. So thanks again, Andy. Everybody go and enjoy the beautiful, when you finish work, I can't say go and enjoy it straight away. I'll get in, in trouble with all your bosses, but I hope you all enjoy the wonderful weather we're experiencing and I really look forward to seeing you all on future sessions take care everybody have a great week bye-bye I'm going to stop that recording there so thanks